Hey guys and welcome to another episode of Comment Commentary, the show on this channel where I go through some of your comments and make corrections and addendums and all that kind of stuff. Um, this episode today is coming to you in lieu of a weekend podcast. I am very excited to say that I'm going to be going to Summer in the City this year, which is a YouTube convention in London, so obviously I'm going to be strapped for time in that regard. I may very well end up doing one later in the week, or who knows, there might be some opportunities down at Summer in the City, but to be honest, when I go to a like these I tend to not really bother with with cameras and mics and that kind of stuff I tend to go more for like just sort of connecting with the YouTube community which is something that I don't really do that much so but um, I'm going to hopefully sate your thirst for long form content with this comment commentary episode before I start today I would like to make one significant correction uh, to something that I've said about zero net uh, most specifically uh, I think we mentioned in the podcast that it didn't have a centralized um, like ID or account system uh, that it was decentralized. That's not actually the case. Uh, Zero ID, which is the sort of like the ID system that you use to to verify your identity, basically, uh, it is actually a decentralized process. There's a lot of discussion going around in the Zero Net community about whether or not this is necessary or whether or not alternatives can be used. Uh, but apparently, uh, but it is important that I actually point this out because, of course when something is, is being sold as decentralized and there's like an aspect of it. And it's a, it's a separate aspect. Like you don't need to have zero ID in order to in any way use zero net or put up a site on zero net or, or anything like that. Zero net is just a uh, an ID system that you use to identify with certain sites, i.e. leave comments and, and that kind of stuff. But um, but there is like, it does seem to be like a community movement within the zero net developers and the zero net uh, community members to actually try and come up with a, a more decentralized way that doesn't rely on something uh, centralized. So anyway, thought I needed to make that correction. So, um, so there it is. Also, another kind of announcement is that the IRC chat room, which I've set up and announced in a video by two or three videos ago, is actually going really, really well. It's a great opportunity for me to talk to a lot of you guys um, in sort of in real time and also a good opportunity for you guys to learn off each other as well. And I'm certainly learning a lot off you guys there. So if you want to check it out, um, the easiest way is just to go to irc.whowhatwhere.download. I'll put links and details down in the comment section uh, in the description. Um, it's irc.geekshed.net and the room, of course, is hashtag who, what, where. Uh, you can use your own IRC client or use the web one that I shall provide in the link uh, below. Okay, so the first comment today comes from Justin Krauser, who says, As you were aware, mm -hmm, uh, Manjaro XFCE, the flagship distribution, um, and I've noticed that it comes with Adobe Flash and Oracle's Java 8 pre-installed. Since it's a rolling release, is it safe to remove both completely from the system without breaking it. The reason I ask is that normally you shouldn't remove anything that comes pre-installed on your operating system due to security, yet I hate Flash and Java as I barely have a need for them and the best security is limiting your attack slash vulnerability areas. Okay, so I can really only share my experience, but my experience is that it's generally pretty safe to remove the optional components of, of Manjaro and that would include Flash and Java. Now, just because I've done it and managed to get away with it, I don't necessarily know whether or not that that's uh, information and advice that can be applied unilaterally to to uh, Manjaro XFCE users. I would recommend if you were, you know, if if you had a sort of production ready machine that you were you didn't want to risk breaking to try it in a virtual machine. But in in my experience, particularly with Manjaro, uh, taking away some of the sort of surface level components is generally pretty safe. I have when I've set up machines for other people, I often use Lubuntu because it's lightweight and it's generally user friendly to use, but if you want to sort of edit or change stuff around, you have to go through a few more steps in the process so it stops people from accidentally messing up their system. So I find that LXDE and, and Lubuntu is the best options for that. But I often remove Abbey Word and uh, numeric in favor of LibreOffice in a lot of cases, and I've had zero problems with, with doing that as well. So Again, I have certainly botched and broken systems uh, by removing components that I shouldn't have. The thing that I would say to be aware of is um, if you were to type, if you were to, to remove uh, any applications through something like Pac-Man or even the, uh, the built-in GUI, um, it will tell you what um, dependencies it will remove along with that. And um, you can then sort of assess how likely it is to cause damage from the, the additional components that it will remove. But providing that you do the reading and providing that it's really only the surface level components like Flash and Java, you should be able to get away with it. But um, 
but that's just my advice. Um, if anyone has anything clearer or, or more succinct or, or something more authoritative, please uh, just say so in the comments section below um, and hopefully we can share the knowledge that way. So I recently did um, a, another video on the Manjaro i3 and a lot of you really, really, uh, really like that. I'm just scrolling now through comments. Um, Ahat Sona says that it was a really good idea that they put the uh, basic commands on the on the desktop wallpaper and that really helped me in fact on my netbook where I've got i3 installed uh, the i3 Manjaro installed just as a as a go-to distribution on lightweight netbook machines uh, it really helps because it allows when I just pick up um, the the netbook after not having used um, after not having used uh, it for a while uh, it's still very easy just to get into the flow and sometimes you just need that that quick push of of knowing you know meta key and enter is is what opens the the terminal um, and then you've got meta key shift and space is what pulls it into a separate window that you can change the size of and so forth so just you know and and, and then you start sort of almost by association um getting back into the swing of using i3. Uh, i3 is definitely my favorite tiling window manager at the moment. A lot of you guys have been recommending more lightweight ones, ones in fact some of which that you even have to re well, like when you want to change it the config setting, that you actually have to recompile it and then reinstall it. Some of them are that uh sort of bare metal as it were. Um but i3 is a good um Certainly, I find it's a good introduction, and it's certainly got a lot of features, and it certainly is very stable, and the documentation is really good on the website as well. So that is, uh, that's awesome. So uh, a comment here from uh, Terry's Tech and Things says, uh, you just switched to KDE after being an XFCE guy for the part of a year. Uh, rem uh, really surprised at how trimmed down it's gotten. I'm running it on, f uh, I'm running it fine on an A, um, an AMD A6 laptop with AMD R4 graphics and 8 gigs of RAM, just as quick as XFCE and looks fantastic. Um, and that's on Manjaro. Yeah, I'm, I really like the KDE implementation of Manjaro on, um, the, the, the KDE implementation on Manjaro. Um, and this is actually, this comment was left on the KDE Neon. And there were a number of KDE Neon comments that uh of, of sort of various satisfaction with the operating system um and kde neon is definitely one of those operating systems that um is for a very specific subset of linux users uh, if you wanted something that was just stable and only stable then this is obviously not something that you'd want to use i probably didn't make that clear enough in the original video um it's really for people that are just kde enthusiasts that want um that, that aren't really too fussed about some of the other components Obviously, uh, Ubuntu 1606, no, 1604, that this was based on, is has had a lot of complaints. And in fact, in deployments that I've uh, issued with uh, 1604, I've had the, the infamous Wi-Fi problem, where basically you have Wi-Fi... Um, for a while, and then I think once you've once you finish the installation process and reboot, then it has trouble reconnecting. Um, my way of actually getting around it on a lot of the older machines that I administrate um, is just to roll back the version of Ubuntu to fourteen oh four. Boy, that shouldn't have to be done, but it was, and thank God most people who um, you know who are involved, you know who 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 own the computers, um, sort of understood the situation, and considering that. 1604 and 1404, providing you only use them for the base, you know, if, for, for sort of basic uses as in internet um, surfing and uh, and like office utils and all that kind of stuff, then 1404, you know, it's still supported for a good long while yet, and it's got a lot less problems with it. I am really disappointed that 1404, a uh, 1604 has not had the, has, has not fixed the error, even though they're well aware of it. Um, and I, 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 I gotta say, that's actually really disappointing because as someone that's an advocate for Linux, Ubuntu and the Ubuntu based distributions are, are go to distributions for a lot of people. Um, and they're often ones that I will recommend. If you want something that you, you know, if you're willing to put the time in to learn how Linux works, but you want something that actually is, you know, well supported that a lot of people use and is somewhat easy. You know, Ubuntu does just tick a lot of lot of the boxes. It's a well known distribution as well, so people know, uh, you know, what it is when you bring it up in in Linux conversations. Um, and I don't actually have a go to secondary for um, for a really user friendly distribution that works on low end machines. Um, some people I'm sure would recommend Linux Mint uh, Mate Edition, which is good. 
Uh, but it's not really lightweight enough for computers that I'd say are more than five years old. And there are computers that I'm administrating that are 15 years old. So, um, you know, I'm really, uh, I'm really, you know, a lot of the times people will come to me and they say, Chris, I, my computer's getting all slow. I think I need to buy a new one. What do you recommend? And at that point, you know, I'd, I'd sort of ask them about what their price is like and, and what the computer they currently have got, got is. And in a very large majority of cases, um, they're happy that to put off buying a new machine in lieu of trying out Linux. And, you know, I'll put Linux on this, this old machine and revive it. And I, they, they're, they're almost always really satisfied that they have their computer working at a solid speed again with reliability, doing the things that they were, you know, doing before, which is just, it's internet and office utilities. And to be honest, a lot of people now, more and more people are moving over to things like Google Drive. And I know there are going to be a lot of people on this channel that, that don't like Google Drive for, for a lot of very, very, very legitimate reasons. But it does make word processing and spreadsheets are a lot more accessible to people who are not tech savvy. And I work with a lot of elderly people and, I, and, 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 and it's really sort of, it's really important to bear in mind that user friendliness is really important because, you know, a lot of people that I work with or work for, they don't want to spend too much time on computers. Um, they're not as good at learning new things and learning new ways to work. And a lot of this is intimidating. So it's really important to make these things as easy as possible. And that sometimes does mean sacrificing free and open source software in favor of, of non free solutions. Um, because the alternative is, um, you know, is, is something that's not really pragmatically workable. Um, and I know a lot of you guys probably going to disagree with that, um, you know, with a, with a lot of that. But but I, I'm the one in the field, and I'm the one that's got to make a living out of it. That's the thing. So so user friendliness and this kind of thing, you know, it is really. Um, super important and that's why it's incredibly important that flagship linux distributions work the way they say they're going to work now my option could also be well i could put arch on and i could put manjaro on and that would in theory be quite good because it means you have you start off with an up-to-date um set of software you can you can lock down the system to a degree where it makes it difficult for people to uh, accidentally do something wrong so accidentally break an upgrade process or, or something like that and, and you know i administrate upgrades myself so that means that in a lot of cases um I, I could i could sort of upgrade then but then you start you know that's generally perhaps not the, the wisest way of, of, of doing things so so i don't know like i don't there isn't like necessarily the immediate go-to safe um safe place that uh, that ubuntu provided Many machines that I do still work on are not affected by some of the more severe problems with the new 1606 release of Ubuntu, but, uh, you know, it's disappointing. I think Ubuntu have really let the side down on this one. Um, and that's, that's all I can say. I, like the thing is, I don't like being too negative on this channel. I think that the free and open source software world, um, w you know, we're a, we're a community of problem solvers and, uh, and that's great. But um, th this is a big problem that hasn't been solved by some pretty big names. So I, I just wish that wasn't the case, really. And I, I you know, it should it shouldn't be the case, but it is, and that's disappointing. So um, some of you guys were also saying, well, what's the difference between uh, KDE Neon and Kubuntu? And um, whereas I did sort of explain, you know, sort of express the changes. Um, I, I probably didn't make the distinction between uh, KDE Neon and Kden. Uh, not sorry, not Kden Live. Kubuntu. The different. The, I, I probably didn't strike the difference between KDE Neon and Kubuntu particularly well. So basically, um, KDE Neon is like Kubuntu, except that the KDE portion of the um, distribution uh, is is constantly updated to the latest version. Whereas with Kubuntu, it will pick the version that it wants to ship with and it will stay at that version until six months or two years down the line, depending on long-term support releases, um, where they will then upgrade. So they upgrade in stages, whereas um, KDE Neon upgrades, they say almost in not real time, but you're like, you can expect the latest KDE desktop to be rolled out like one or two days after it's been released on the KDE website. This is a distribution um, that KDE imagined, as it were. And I think that's a really good idea, even if it's just a showcase distribution. Um, and a lot of you are probably, well, like KDE does release um, buggy releases from time to time, especially like I, I remember um, QT4 and Plasma 5, which is called Plasma 5, but we still call it KDE because the last four have been called KDE. 
Um, so that is certainly the case, um, and it's a and it's a big f- fault of 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 KDE in in my view that like you have one one um, release that's like brilliant and and stable and flawless, and then well maybe, maybe not flawless but you know what I mean. And then the next release could be you know it could be it could have trouble even keeping Windows open. So um, so it is it does seem to be a bit hot and cold in in that regard but the i suppose the idea behind kde neon in some regards is that problems might arise more often but they can also be fixed quicker so and that's often the um the 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 sort of the legitimate rationale of rolling releases and certainly something that i found is that if using manjaro i come up against a bug or an error i the wor- you know, like in in a, in a worst case scenario, it it could it could be that I just have to wait for a fix, but it means that I get the fix reasonably speedily, um, being on a rolling release. Uh, obviously, with Manjaro, things are held back a little longer for stability reasons and security reasons and so forth, but it's still better than than being on a uh, scheduled release. Uh, Sumitri uh, Patniak um, asks which uh, of the distributions out of Arch or Ubuntu uh, have the most packages in their repositories. I haven't actually measured this, um, but I'm pretty sure it's Arch, especially if you include the AUR, the Arch user repository, which is of course a I'm not going to call it a community repository because there are community repositories in Arch, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's it facilitates third-party package distribution. If you include AUR, um, I don't think I've ever found I, I, uh, Arch has everything in that when it comes to packages. If you include the AUR, sometimes the packages in the AUR are not always packaged properly or well, or you know, even you know, and and, and that can actually be a, a vulnerability in many ways. In fact, some of the packages in the AUR, I'm pretty convinced, aren't even that safe. But it's a case of knowing what it is that you're downloading. So when you do install something from the AUR in Arch, just do a Google search for it. Just check out the maintainer and all that kind of stuff, just to make sure that it's been maintained regularly. It's by a, uh, you know, it's by someone that you feel is is legit, and it's you know, preferably it 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 would come directly from the the source of the dis uh, source of the application. And if I was developing an application for Linux, you know, I, I, along with the making sure that there's a third party PPA for Ubuntu, I'd also make sure that it was properly packaged in the AUR, if not in, you know, sort of uh, uh, branches close to home when it comes to Arch, excluding the AUR, because I can imagine a lot of people don't like using the AUR just on the sole basis of, of it being potentially insecure. Um, and of course, correct me if I'm wrong on, on any of that down in the, the comment section below. Um, I still find that packages make it into the Arch repositories quicker than they make it into the Ubuntu ones by sometimes a factor of years, uh, especially when it comes to things like Simple Screen Recorder and OBS Studio. Um, yeah, so I de- it's, that's definitely Arch. Arch definitely has more packages. You can look at something like Debian and you can make the argument that Debian do a lot better quality testing or quality assurance and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, you can have that debate for time imm- immemorial, as I'm sure people have. But um, but yeah, Arch definitely has more packages. That's that's pretty uh, that's pretty stark. Uh, Michael Cox says, "I was Windows, then ten happened with all its crap. Now I am Linux." Yeah, I read that co- comment like three times, scanning through, and has, I always read it in that voice. Um. A lot of you guys thanked Benjamin, um, Benjamin Nalan, who has been. Um, uh, has been a great help to this channel lately. Um, not only has he funded the podcast for a year, but he's also helped out on a um, a zero net site that is going to be hosting these videos as well. I'll put a link to it down in the description below. It's still a work in progress at the moment, but it looks very promising. Um, and if you guys have been watching my zero net videos and um, my my zero net um, stuff on live streams and whatnot, you'll probably be more familiar with it. I also want to thank somebody else. Uh, who has put the like a, like a huge amount of work into the website? They'll tell you that it's not a lot of work, but um, but 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 uh, you know it, it's it's time and it's consideration and it's valuable. So uh, thank somebody else as well, as in somebody else, if if that makes sense. Not ordinary in games asks is light worse in any way, and that was on the Manjaro BSPWM video. Uh, it was on the Manjaro BSPWM video because it ships with a browser called Light, which is 
basically a, a slimmed down version of Firefox. Now I've only had a limited testing on this, but it seems to run almost exactly as Firefox does with just a f few fewer bells and whistles. Um, it has, um, you know, it, it runs it runs really speedily when I've tested it, even just in a virtual machine. Um, it seems to support all of the same add-ons that and, and extensions that Firefox has. I I can't vouch for that uh, explicitly, but it's, it's certainly you know the ones that I've installed have. Um, I'm surprised that it's not actually more popular, but I, it seems to be ditching things like the Pocket add-on that comes included with it. It seems to be ditching things like the uh, like Firefox Hello, but Firefox Hello is being ditched anyway. So it um, it depends what you consider worse. Um, but but probably no. It probably could very well be an improvement. The only thing I would say about it is that um, is that it could very well not be update, uh, updated as regularly as as its Firefox counterpart. But again, that's something that you need to to check up on because I don't. I'm again not not particularly familiar with the browser, but it does look like. Um, Oh, and it doesn't, and it also doesn't seem to have um, very much support when it comes to like live streaming and WebRTC. But I suppose, depending on um, uh, on all that, that's a, that's a personal preference as well. I know there are going to be a number of you guys who who um, who are going to be quite against the use of WebRTC. Um, Gary Cheng twelve uh, wants to recommend the Reddit uh, Reddit dot com forward slash r forward slash Unix porn. Not exactly as it sounds, uh, but it's a lot of um, screenshots of uh, interesting desktops and what they look like. Nothing to do with Unix. It's Unix porn, <laughs> and because um, that would that that Unix porn would be a rather interesting subreddit if nothing else. But no, this is Unix porn, and it's um, yeah, it's for customizing um, environments and aesthetics and. Um, and, and just sort of showing off your fancy desktops. And if you want to see Linux in its most beautiful capacity, that is a good um, subreddit to check out. Also, side note on Reddit, it's one of the very few social media platforms that is mostly open source. The parts that they don't open source include things like the spam filter and the artwork, I think, are the two things that they don't open source. But other, th but um, you can actually see um, in uh, in the internet on the web uh, many other clones of, of Reddit that use the base source code and then um, build it elsewhere. So if you are uh, if you're interested in the open source side of things, check out the uh, check out what Reddit have to say about the open source of their code because that's pretty cool. And I wish more I wish more social media sites did that. Mastoru Zelif says, uh, "Too bad I can't convince my friends to use this. They'd rather use Skype and Facebook Messenger." Sad face. Yeah, this is basically um, a huge problem when it comes to um, trying to introduce free and open source software into the social media sphere because the social media sphere is is not only is it incredibly competitive, and and that's that's hardly the controversial statement of the year. Um, but they do make they do go through some lengths to unfederate their platform to make it so that their pla so that you have to go onto their website or you have to use their app um and the incentive for that is is pretty obvious it's advertising uh sites like facebook and twitter are funded by advertising and therefore you have to view the content in the way that they basically pre-approve so that they can uh turn a profit and things like you know social media platforms and companies they do need to make money um Reddit, the Reddit model seems to be a little bit more sustainable in the sense that people buy Reddit gold, and that's the that's what funds the site. There is some advertising on Reddit, but it's certainly a secondary source of income, and it's certainly more ethical as well. Um, they use, um, as I understand it, they don't use tracking in the same way that Google Ads do. Uh, you just buy the ad space and, and chuck it up on on Reddit and you know in a more sort of old fashioned traditional kind of way um and it's also more in the spirit of traditional advertising um i help run my local carnival parade basically um as a you know, just 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 to be a good citizen and all that and there is some advertising involved with this but the spirit is completely different you don't get companies that come up to you and say i want to advertise but i want to know how many pays per click or uh, i want to make sure that i get a return on my my investment a lot of the sponsors that sponsor town projects they do it because yeah i mean they do get their name out there into the town and that's obviously beneficial for business but they do it because they want to support a lively community because when the community is lively the community is healthy and when the community is healthy 
uh, you know, stuff improves across the board, and that, and and then businesses can be caught up on that. But the attitude isn't to make as much money as possible in the shortest amount of time, as it seems that so many other companies are. But it just seems to be to be the the, the idea is to just sort of push whatever companies the sponsor in question to be um, just a, as a as a positive role in the community, and that is certainly possible. Um, and that seems to be more of the spirit of advertising on Reddit is that not everything has to be tracked. You know, not everything's all about clicks. Sometimes, um, you know, it's it's just about uh, doing something that, you know, is, is, is mutually beneficial and just not exploiting as much out of it as you can, basically. So, um, but there you go. Also, another problem, actually, with Tox, and uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, decentralization, uh, when it comes to um, social media and the internet and all this kind of stuff. And decentralization is one uh, avenue that we can go down. Another is, is federal, uh, federalization. So the difference between um, decentralization and federalization is that decentralization is like BitTorrent. Everyone's got a copy of a file or a large number of people have a copy of a file on their desktop and um, then they can collectively sync those files together with people that also want access to those files so that you can actually um, trans you know you can actually move files across the internet very easily and very quickly without actually having to use expensive servers and all that kind of stuff because you're already collecting the resources collectively and then you're using that um, with federalization federalization is a lot more uh, can is you know a good example of federalization would be email where you choose a company um, to to provide to provide and host your email. Well, I suppose you could do it yourself, but that's an awful lot of work. So you choose a company that takes care of your email for you, and you can then communicate with other companies that take care of email for other people. So you've got a network made up of smaller com but um, individual and self-sufficient components, so that you know Yahoo can get bought out by Verizon, and Yahoo Mail could could go the way of the dodo. But that doesn't mean email. Is in any way harmed. Email's as strong as it's ever been. I know people always love to write these blog articles. Email is dying. Email is dying. No, it's not. I, I you know, I run a business. Email is really, really important because it's federalized, which means that it's reliable, providing you choose a reliable server to host your email, and it's also universal. So it doesn't mean that I'm restricted to, to talking to people on Gmail or on Hotmail or you know on any on any, on any other single platform. So. Uh, another good example of federalization is IRC, the IRC chat rooms. I'm going to plug the who, what, where IRC chat room again, link in the description. Um, and the reason, uh, you know, and, and, and IRC has been around since 1988. So it, you know, federalized networks, when they take off, they, they stand the test of time pretty convincingly, at least in my personal opinion. I think that there is a lot to be said for decentralization. Zero net is like basically trying to decentralize the World Wide Web. And even though at the moment it's almost still in a proof of concept stage and there seem to be only a couple of thousand uh, sort of really dedicated users, I got to say that if more and more people take this on, you know, come on board, and if Zero net finds maybe a more user-friendly way to get out there, and I, I you know, my I suppose advice, my self-important advice uh, to Zeronet would be develop a browser, base it on Firefox or base it on Chrome or whatever, right? But if they could build a browser that was specifically designed to interact with Zeronet, uh, I think that would be like a huge step in, in the right direction. I think you'd see a lot more um, adoption, in, sort of in the same way that you uh, Tor, the Tor network have built a browser. Now there is more... Um, there is there's more of an integrated uh you know sort of security reasons why tor is integrated into a browser rather than like a browser add-on or anything like that but um with zero net you know you could do the same thing like downloading a, a, a browser and installing it is, is a piece of cake uh but getting your current browser to interact with the zero net network is again if you're interested and enthusiastic like i and many of the people watching this channel are Again, not a problem, but um, with decentralized networks, the more people that use it, the stronger it becomes. Interestingly enough, though, of course, when it comes to things like federalized networks or even centralized networks that all rely on servers and things like that, um, uh, the more people who use them, the more resources they start using up. 
So, uh, because, you know, with, with like centralized systems in particular, uh, as a consumer, you're only expected to take and take and take and take in a lot of ways, or at least use resources. Whereas with a decentralized network and to some degree federalized networks as well, um, you're expected, but specifically with decentralized networks, you're expected to put in as much as you take out and, or, or you're expected at least in some way to contribute. And even if you're not, it doesn't necessarily still hurt the, the overall process, but, um, you know, there's a, there's a reason why BitTorrent has been around for as long as it has as well. So just to wrap up uh, everything about Tox, um, the thing about Tox is that, yes, it is bundled into its own piece of software and it can be installed really quite easily, actually. And a number of people who aren't techie people have tried out Tox and have really liked it, but it does suffer that perennial problem of it doesn't have enough users on it already to worth people downloading and using. Um, and that in and of itself becomes sort of, or it's almost like a self-replicating problem. Um, people won't use it because people aren't on it. So there are people who aren't on it. <laughs> so, um, and my way around that would be, I don't know, it's difficult because even with something like Tox, you don't need to sign up. You just need to put your name in. Um, IRC is really quite useful as well for non-techie people because you don't need to sign up for that. And I think that's certainly a key is that unless you need to sign up for something, you shouldn't, have to sign up for something. Um, there should be, a, you know, really good ways of using the system and even ways of identifying yourself that don't actually rely on sticking a name on a big database. And I hope that there is some um, progression on that. And there is, as I understand it, there are people working on this, but, and Tox uses a completely decentralized ID system, which seems to work quite well as well. So, and there are ways of doing it. Uh, they're not necessarily immediately obvious at first, but you can have a decentralized ID network. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it's getting people on it. And I think that, you know, if we do start seeing a net, you know, a, a instant messaging network that transcends, um, all of the social media sites and all this kind of stuff, and you have just this, this one, you know, you, you turn instant messaging as accessible as email is right now. It, you know, it would, it would look very similar to the XMPP where you can sign up at DuckDuckGo or Jitsi for an XMPP account. You can log into your XMPP account on uh, like Pigeon or whatever instant messaging client you want to use. But again, it still suffers the, the problem of uh, people not just using it and then people not using it because other people don't use it, which again kind of sucks. And also with something like XMPP, you also have to bear in mind that pe there is a sign up process as well. But just as long as you're not signing up with... Um, you know, it's it, it's not a centralized list. There isn't like a big list at Facebook or whatever that has all the usernames. It's it's, it's separated. It's federalized, and there's you know increase in you know there's increased security for that, and there's also increased things like privacy and competition as well. I think you know when you've got multiple different uh, companies providing uh, access to a federalized network, those companies have to compete with each other to be the most accessible and to be maybe the most cost effective or maybe even to provide the, the, the best features. And different people provide, you know, different companies can provide different things. For example, I make a point of paying for email because when you pay for email, you are entitled to certain legal rights. Um, I, th I don't know what the exact legalese is for it. I think it's called consideration. Whereas uh, if you give something away for free, um, it's an entirely different legal process than if you sell something. Um, even if you sell something for a pound or a very small amount of money, that's against, I think it's called something like consideration, which means that you have then consumer rights, which is why I think you sometimes see these big companies like, um, if you want to go back a couple of decades, when Bearings Bank uh, went under uh, and it was eventually sold to... Uh, I think it was a, a Middle Eastern businessman for a pound and... It's like, well, why do you sell a bank for a pound? Well, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was in millions, if not billions, of pounds in debt. Um, but it had, you know, someone, someone wanted, to, someone took that on board for one reason or another. But you had to sell it in order to, uh, to have all that legal protection and consideration involved. Uh, it, again, if I'm wrong on that, please correct me in the comment section below, because, um, because I don't want to be wrong if I can help it. Uh, par 3 suggested on the podcast when I upload it to YouTube to put timestamps for all the sections. Uh, I'm going to try and do that in future podcasts. Um, I can't do it in comment commentaries because there are just so many comments and sometimes I reference multiple comments and all that kind of stuff. Um, in fact, even in this video, I'm probably not going to have the time to put the comments up on screen. So I apologize if I've either misread your comment or... Um, 
or it's been bundled in with like a whole bunch of other comments. But like I say, I'm I'm supposed to be getting ready for summer in the city right now, and I just didn't uh, I didn't want to leave you guys dry for a bit. A lot of you guys actually, I was very surprised. I'm just scrolling down now, and I'm looking at a number of people that don't like Slack, um, mostly because it focuses around proprietary stuff. Uh, and a lot of you guys just seem to go seem to say that your projects. Um, just generally just revert back to IRC because IRC is just the easiest project management site. And, you know, having been on IRC a fair bit over the past few days, sort of introducing people to the IRC channel, another shameless plug, the link down in the description. Um, I've got to say it is. And there are a few little things that make all the difference. So for me, for example, the screen real estate for IRC, my IRC client, which is hex chat, but you use whatever one you, you wish. Um, it makes really good use of screen real estate. If you notice with like Twitter, you notice that actually there is so much unused space on the screen, you could actually read so much more. So if you go to tweet, if you if you're a Twitter user, you can go to tweet deck t double uh, t w e e t deck d e c k dot twitter dot com, and uh, you can actually sign in using your Twitter uh, account because it, it is a Twitter service, and it actually um, allows you to customize the layout of your Twitter. Also, um, add in additional Twitter accounts if you administrate uh, Twitter accounts. Um, uh, if you administrate more, multiple Twitter accounts, uh, and it actually is is a much more uh, it, it puts a lot more information on the screen at once, which is uh, which is what I quite like. It's uh, it plays hell with system resources though. TweetDeck is. Yeah, TweetDeck is 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 um it, it it really does slow down the browser a lot of times. So sometimes I just uh, I just have my my usual old Twitter up. But um, but I gotta say, you know, with a lot of social networks in their attempt to make their websites both mobile friendly and desktop friendly at the same time, they seem to to be playing fast and loose with the screen real estate and with um and and that means that you know you there's a lot less information on the screen at any one time. And whereas that in part is is you know, it makes information more digestible in a lot of ways. Um, with IRC, uh, you know, you can send links through there. You got, you know, it just it just works. I don't know, like it it it's simple, and everyone, you know, and, and I think that it's simple, and it allows you know a lot of information to be displayed on the screen in an like an in a pretty readable format as well. And also, you can cut, you know, there's like infinite options for customizability, right down from choosing your IRC client to. Um, you know, to changing the colors and all that kind of stuff as well. So it's certainly a lot more accessible than most no um, social networks um, as well. And of course, you you don't need to actually sign up for an account. You can just type in an unused nickname and and you're away. So um, I got to say, I've I've always liked IRC. I've sort of re fallen in love with it uh, since opening up the channel. Um, but yeah, it's it's I can I can see I can see why people tend to go f uh, use it for for um, project management as well, and j just sort of um, it's it's a you know it is it's a good way to manage conversations and it's a good way to share information and it's it's yeah it's a good way to make sure everyone's caught up on the same page. It, the thing is, I, I don't really know why I always get myself into comparing IRC with Twitter. Maybe it's just the two social networks that I use at all. Actually, I think and. Um, and the thing about IRC that is that people listen to you on IRC because of the way that the, the rooms work and because of how how it's just it just works as a system with all these little nuances that you don't necessarily even register. Um, it, IRC is almost like Twitter where people listen to you and you can have a proper conversation. With Twitter, it just seems to be some kind of broadcast broadcast platform uh, for for a lot of self important people who don't really have that much to say. Uh, maybe I can include myself in that critique as well, I guess. But um, it doesn't seem like it, it's a very good environment for fostering meaningful conversations, um, and specifically conversations in a way where two people who disagree on a point can actually discuss it and uh, and respect each other's intelligence while at the same time disagreeing. And I, I sort of realized the importance of this when I was watching the town hall um, with Gary Johnson. Um, I think it was on CNN. Presented by Anderson Cooper, and I, I, I do not agree with Gary Johnson on economic policy at all. Um, but I've been following his record as, as governor and as a third-party presidential candidate, and I've got to say, just on what I know from him, is that he's one of those people that is clearly very intelligent and clearly very good at articulating his viewpoint in a lot of situations, and he has a solid plan. 
he has an idea he has a plan right which so well which 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 one specific presidential candidate does not have and um and and he you know he demonstrates that plan and he explains it and he explains his ideo- you know ideology behind the plan sure i don't sure i don't agree with it and sure i would probably never vote for him but it's always nice to challenge your ideas and you can really only challenge your ideas with someone who's respectful and intelligent and sometimes intelligent people aren't respectful and sometimes respectful people aren't intelligent but you know finding someone who's both and that you disagree with you know and that when it comes to sort of you know challenging your opinions a lot of people think that debate is for some reason just this way that 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 you can condense down and find a truth but if you've got two idiots debating you're not going to find any kind of fundamental truth there for, you know finding a truth through discussion and debate can really only work when you respect the person that you're debating with or you respect the two people that are debating each other and you're watching and you have to respect that you know that they're intelligent and that they know their own personal subject matter and perspective and then when it comes together you can you know you can find the common ground or you can disagree on um aspects that you disagree with but if you respect the other people you know the, the the person in question has put the research in has put the you know time in and has worked it out then it's a lot easier to disagree with someone um and sort of still respect it and still actually have that idea their ideas in your head so that when uh so you know because it still helps you grow as a person at least that's that's how i find it as well um uh, and I actually quite enjoy listening to uh, people who I consider to be intelligent and respectful, but uh, I disagree with. Which is maybe part of the reason why we have so many constructive discussions on uh, on this channel. I feel like I've caught lightning in a bottle with you guys. I really do. You know, when the when the world of social media just seems to be turning to shit and everyone's shouting at each other and no one's listening, and I've got this little you know corner with you guys who seem to be you know we, we seem to be growing as a as a group. Um, and not just growing as a group in our numbers. I mean, growing in a group as as, as becoming smarter people as it is. See, for me, uh, just having a platform and an audience on YouTube just isn't enough. It's got to be a, a an intelligent and smart audience. And I'm so glad that that's sort of come to pr- fruition. Because what the hell would a YouTube channel be worth if all it was was people that that just nodded and agreed with me and 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 didn't think for themselves? So you know i i feel that i feel really lucky and proud and privileged that uh, that you guys are, are intelligent and thoughtful and you, you when you disagree um you you do so pretty politely like i think a fight in the comment section of a youtube video on my channel breaks out about once a month and 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 that's that's a really good going rate if you ask me so so thank you i guess i don't know i i was originally talking about tox wasn't i uh, Tox, I really like it. I know some of you guys think it's overrated. I know that some of you guys think that it's just going to have such a hard time competing with Steam, uh, with um, Skype. But um, but I, th- I think that there is promise for it. If you could just have a simplified application in the corner of your, uh, you know, in in, a, in like um, a system tray, and it was just specific to each computer, and it was just a very simple pre-set up messaging system. That was also an, uh, the, the sort of was also anonymous and decentralized. Um, you could use other social networks, but if you just wanted to just send a file across to another computer or just send a quick message, um, having just a built-in Tox application built into the UI could actually be really good for that. Um, it might not necessarily be your your main line of communication, but it could simply just be a quick instant messaging tool that um, almost like the Facebook Messenger of an operating system it works in a very similar way uh, it would it could work in a very similar way um but again that's uh that's just 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 one of my thoughts okay so i'm going to go down onto my final two comments um because this is pretty much now where i'm go- going to well, yeah, because beyond that i'd be going over old ground i guess um neil rutherford says hello chris what are your views on lubuntu 1604 i find that i can upgrade from 1404 which was installed via live cd however if i want a fresh install of 1604.1 i have to use the alternative cd and the live cd graphics screw up do you think they're going to fix this 1404 worked Okay, yeah, I've covered this a little bit in uh, previously. Um, 1604 is a disappointment. I really want to say something otherwise, and and I probably should have leaned on that a little bit more in 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 the reviews. But the the betas for Ubuntu just look so promising, and Snap looks really promising as well. But God, there are some big glaring errors that they haven't even got sorted out by the point one release. Oh, I don't know why. I don't know why they're cave. They gotta be so. Yeah, I don't know. 
I don't know. Um, so it is such a mixed distribution. And the thing is, when a mainstream distribution has a, is mixed, that means it's bad. When a fringe distribution that's trying out new and exciting things like um, Chromixium, you know, when they make a mistake or something, that's a lot more forgivable because it's um, they're trying something new. They're trying to, uh, you know, it's, it's a niche distribution. It's not designed for mass adoption. But this is a different story. Um, do you think they're going to fix it? They have to fix it. They have to fix it. They've got to fix it. <sighs> Please fix it. Um, but you know what? I... I, I would look to Manjaro, um, maybe. Have a look. Um, maybe try the live CD. Um, th I think that the Manjaro i3 is really quite nice. I run it on a really old netbook. Probably, I would guess, significantly lower performance than what you might have there because this, this netbook I've got is terrible. Um, don't be afraid to stay on 1404 for a little while longer, though. I mean, it is a good distribution, especially once you've you've got it settled in. It's still supported... Um, oh, dear me, now my memory's letting me down. Um, it's either supported for three years or five years, depending on the distribution. Um, it might even be worth waiting until 1410 if you, if you don't want a, an LTS, if you're happy to go with a non-LTS. Um... Mint XFCE might be another option, but again, that might just be a little bit more, use a little more system resources. Um, consider Debian. Debian, again, it's not the most user-friendly one out there, but it's pretty rock solid, and it, depending on what you'd use it for, it's pretty lightweight. It's pretty lightweight. You can get a good um, XFCE or LXDE desktop on Debian and be quite happy with it. You might be a little bit strapped when it comes to non-free... Uh, file formats. There are ways of, get, of of installing, I think, third party, uh, not third party, you know, like additional repositories and whatnot. Um, you have obviously a, 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 a smaller pool of selection when it comes to Debian because you, you th installing third party software on Debian is uh, it, it's it's highly unreliable. Something that I'd advise against. But if you can find everything you want in the repositories of Debian, uh, that could very well be an option for lightweight desktop environments as well. Uh, and the final, final question from Stefan uh, Sigal, uh, who says, uh, Not a native English speaker. I am from Bavaria, Germany, and more and more happy every day that I learnt English at school. Uh, helps me connecting with people all over the world and discover who share their knowledge and meanings in such a, an interesting and entertaining way like you do. German YouTube sucks, by the way, sad face. I'm sorry to hear German uh, YouTube sucks, by the way. Um... But I just wanted to finish on this comment by saying that my German is pretty terrible. Uh, so I kind of feel... So, uh, uh, but I have been to Germany, I think, about two or three times now, and I've loved it um, every single time. Um, and I love the German people and the Austrian people as well. I've been to Austria once uh, on a, on a, on a, uh, a week-long trip. And, uh, and I've got to say, I love that part of the world. Um, and, um, and I'm certainly going to be going back there again. Uh, and also, thank you very much for the kind words. A lot of people have been complimenting me a lot lately, and uh, and I do want to say thank you. Um, I'm not I'm not used to getting very compliments, and I'm not very good at accepting them. Um, but thank you. I mean, it, I like it really means a lot. Um, so um, yeah, you, you can see what I mean by I'm not very good at accepting uh, compliments now. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope this uh, this video has been. It's, well, it's recording at 51 minutes, but there's going to, probably going to be some bits that are cut out. Um, thank you very much for watching. If you've made it all the way to the end, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. The question is, have you ever been to London? And if so, what did you think about it? That's like the secret question. Answer that question in the comments if you'd like to let me know that you've made it all the way through the video. Um, I've been to London many times. I'm going to London, of course, this weekend. I don't really like London. It's just very busy and very polluted. Uh, the, uh, you know, I live out here in the country. I live quite near the forest where the Dagobah scenes from the new Star Wars film were, were shot. Um, and also there was uh, some Doctor Who. They shoot Doctor Who around here. Merlin. They shot a lot of Merlin. Um, they shot so much Merlin around here. I don't know if you've seen the BBC uh, fantasy uh, show. Um, they shot so much Merlin that, like, I recognised the the set that they were on, and it was actually really quite interesting because you could see them, 
wandering like all of like the vast majority of the forest scenes in Merlin are shot in like a square two mile bit of forest uh and it's it's very interesting oh we're going to be traveling we're going to be travel for days and it actually like it just the way they shoot it they actually have, have only traveled like 200 yards down the road um it's it's um but yeah uh it's uh it's absolutely beautiful around where I live, and uh, London is always a bit of a shock to the system in that regard. So, anyway, guys, thank you very, very much for uh, listening. Rather, I hope you weren't just staring at the the, the display screen for the whole of the time. Uh, I hope you were, I don't know, entertaining yourself in one way or another, um, as well as this um, gobbledygook that's hitting the airwaves. Okay, so anyway, thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing your comments on this video and seeing your comments on future videos. Until next time, I've been Chris Ware and you've been awesome. Take care now.